those guys would push those numbers, and then they'd make sure that number didn't come up. Stuff like that. And a lot of it got a lot more intricate than that, but that's sort of the easiest one that I can remember. Also, bootleg. Oh, yeah. Um, sure, no, prohibition, booze is illegal, everyone is sad. So bootlegging is making alcohol, and when we, I say making alcohol, I don't mean making white lightning that, like, rusts your brain cells. I mean making, like, decent alcohol, selling it, running speakeasies. And the Italian mob had control of that, and Bronzeville didn't want it anyway. Also smuggling alcohol. That, too. So, yeah, like, that was working out pretty well, but Al Capone, we all know how that went. Elliot Ness, jail, taxes bad. <laughs> and and uh, good old Sam went to the mob and said, basically, I can give you the policy game in Chicago. I know how to run it. We don't need them. And we can take it. And the mob was like, yeah, that sounds great. Because it's really one of the bigger like money-making sources in Chicago at this point. Um, and so the mob wages a sort of slow war, for lack of a better word, against the policy kings. And Epic story. Very epic. Most of the policy kings get kidnapped, killed, scared off, all that jazz. Jones runs away to Mexico. He doesn't get in any more trouble. It, it's unfortunate. Um, and at the same time, the mayor of Chicago, Kennelly, I don't remember his first name, but Mayor Kennelly, decides that he's going to have a crackdown on the policy game in Chicago. But he only cracks down on the black policy wheels, not the white ones. So the city government is wiping out the policy racket at the same time that the mob is wiping out the policy kings. And this very excellent guy named Theodore Rowe holds out until, like, the mid-40s. He's, he, like, one, he, they try to kidnap him numbers of times, and he, like, knocks out the guy who, you know, tries to drag him to the car and, like, runs away, and, like, he's, you know, refuses to leave. And he, he does a great job of trying to hold out on his own, but they eventually murder him. And <laughs> so they're basically... African-American run crime in Chicago is gone. There are, like, there's still African-Americans working for the wheels. There's some of them working for the mob, because the mob is racist like everyone else, but not as racist as most of the other sort of ethnic gangs. Like, they employ African-Americans. They <coughs> work with them and stuff. But, like, none of them have real positions of power. They're, they're all officially street low-level guys now. And this coincides with another thing that really basically makes African-American, like, in Chicago, like, Somewhat like it is today. Like, obviously the modern era has changed a little, but it sort of, it makes it more into something that we can recognize. African Americans basically had been really strictly limited by law only to live in Bronzeville up until, like, oh, the 19, the sort of the late 1940s. But that began to change. The, the actual legal, like, requirement that you could only live there was relaxed. There was still a lot of restrictions everything from, like, the white people would throw rocks through your window to, like, the real estate agents wouldn't sell to you. But it became possible for the wealthy and upper-class African-Americans to flee, not if not quite to the suburbs, then away. I mean, it did. Because until then, sort of, African-American community was very heterogeneous. Like, you would have normal house, rich guy works as a banker, living next to, like, kitchenette tenement apartments with, like, you know, like, two families to a room. All of the rich people left, and the Binga Bank collapsed during the Depression, and Jesse Binga ended his days as a janitor somewhere, and the sort of wealthy black organized crime collapsed. All of this happened at about the same time. And so there was no one really left to pump money into the community anymore. Like, they, there was nothing to come there for. The infrastructure was beginning to rot, and, like, no one had anything. Around this same time, redlining sort of took the place of, like, actual housing segregation. Now, redlining is a, like, it, it's a, I guess, insurance company, real estate agent practice of, you, basically you assess how much insurance you're willing to give people, how much money you're willing to invest in the buildings, like, whether there's any capital available there, based on a wide variety of things. And one of the big ones during this time was racial composition of the neighborhood. No loans in places with an African-American population. No insurance. Even places next to places where African-Americans lived, like Jewish neighborhoods, which were usually nearby because they were also sort of not invited everywhere else. The amount of insurance they could get or the amount of capital that people would invest there began to go down because they were next door to places that had some African-Americans in them. So the, the inner cities really began to collapse. And it was around, in fact, I think I have the exact 
date on here. Yeah, okay, so the I don't have the exact date that the projects began to go up, but they they started to get them rolling in the early 50s, late for, late 40s because they basically urban renewal started in 1947, but and the restricted covenants that made African Americans live in one place were struck down in 1948. But in 1949, Chicago cut the African Americans out of the urban renewal projects. And it, it was right around then that they started getting sort of the cheap public housing projects going. Now, we all know how the projects went, pretty much. But at the time, they were actually sort of the great liberal experiment. The idea was that they were what was really going to save the city and provide decent housing and good treatment to all of the people who were impoverished in the inner city. And um, the program was actually headed up by an extremely wonderful woman named Elizabeth Wood. She was very liberal, and she was she began fighting to have housing projects put up in white neighborhoods as well as black neighborhoods. She began trying to get it mandated that the projects had to be not just mixed racial backgrounds, like white and black people, but also mixed incomes, like leave spaces for people with more money, less money, that kind of thing. Um, she, she did a good job. She had some successes, not as many as you would hope. She definitely sort of did her best for it, and a lot of it got put in place. And when the first projects went up, they were a mixed race and income, and for a while they were fairly nice places to live, actually. But in, in uh, 1954, she was fired for pushing this agenda, basically. That was, I think, in fact, close to being the stated reason. And the projects immediately became all African-American, no more projects in sort of nicer neighborhoods, or where nicer neighborhoods could see them, as a matter of fact. And um, as slowly the projects began to degrade the way you'd expect them to, the, the families with more money began to move out because the neighborhood was getting, and the infrastructure of the projects, the buildings themselves, were getting worse. And then the white people began to move out. Racism, it happens. And before you knew it, the projects were basically the way we think of them. They were housed very low-income African-American families. There wasn't enough room. They were falling apart. And the neighborhoods began to get dangerous. And this is where you get gangs. It's hard to exactly describe how sort of the first gangs happen. But gangs in Chicago have tended to be youth clubs. Like, they, the, sort of the existence of gangs in Chicago have been here almost as long as the city. The city is very ethnically divided. The neighborhoods are very, sort of, like, they're blocked off by ethnicity, the way we have, like, Greek town now, or, like, Ukraine town, you know, Pilsen, stuff like that. They were like, they've always been like that. And in these neighborhoods, the kids usually start a sports club or a social club, and the clubs have always sort of tended to slowly filter towards being gangs. It's just... They'd come into conflict with people from other ethnic groups, or they'd, hell, if they were a sports club, they'd go to a baseball game with someone else and they'd win, and the other team would attack them because they were angry. In fact, some of the biggest African-American gangs got started exactly like that. I think it was the Cobras, who were originally a baseball team. They kept getting attacked every time they went to a baseball game, even if they lost sometimes. And eventually they got more focused on preparing for the fight after the game than for the game. And then eventually there was no game. Yeah. <laughs> And so before long, you couldn't really live in an African-American community and sort of in a poor one in the south side or, or in the west side without being in a gang. Like, you'd go down the street. If they didn't know you, they'd beat you up. Like, that was, that, that's sort of the story most of the gang members tell about how they got into it. And basically each neighborhood would end up having a gang. Some of the gangs got a lot bigger over time because they would sort of roll on other groups. And people tended to join the bigger gangs if their gang got beaten up enough. So they were, and they would sometimes have like loose gang affiliates with like slightly different names that all technically answered to the same gang. And it's about here that I'm hmm, going to start getting specific again. This book, The Nation of Lords, it's about the Vice Lords. And they will become important.